Hi all, welcome to yet another video which will be basically explaining the module 3 of professional ethics which we titled as Engineering as Social Experimentation. Now, in this particular module, we will be explaining or we will be dealing with uh, what are the, you know, the importance of uh, experimentation in engineering. So let's start with what do you mean by experimentation and what is the importance of experimentation in engineering field as such. The process of engineering lets you go through a series of different experimentation when it comes to the practical use. As we all aware about that, we actually study a lot of subjects. For example, MOS you study, you actually have uh, your uh, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics in your mechanical engineering and your in your civil you have your FM, then you have structure analysis. In your electronics and electrical you have your co-papers and your computer science you have your database and all those things. So when you, what are the things that you study in your classroom? When you go to the lab, you will be having a hands-on experience. You have a practical experience of that particular concept. So in, in short, we would like to say that the whole Prior engineering or the whole course of engineering actually lies on the you know the practical experience that what the students is getting so your experimentation plays a very pivotal role in the process of uh, you know engineering course as such now your experimentation also plays a very important role in designing a product because when you design a product it actually uh, you know uh, goes through different stages as such and one of the important stage is experimentation. You will be experimenting what are the drawbacks, what are the merits, what are the, you know, things that has to be improved in that designing that particular product. So in that way also, your experimentation plays a very important role. Though it is not like a experiment in laboratory under controlled conditions, which, which is being done while learning, an engineer should be ready to do same on a social scale involving human subjects. When you talk about your other subjects, like your subjects like your chemistry, your zoology and botany, they do the experimentation, especially uh, medical sciences, they do the experimentations or experiments in a very controlled conditions. Whereas when it comes to engineering, we don't do it in a very controlled condition. We will be uh, doing it in a very, you know, uncontrolled conditions because we are doing it on, uh, you know, for the welfare of the society as such. Now. Let's examine what are the similarities and what are the differences or what we call it as what are the, uh, you know, what are the things that actually makes this uh, social experimentation as well as your standard experimentation similar and what are the contrast of these both. So now let's examine what are the differences and what are the similarities between your engineering uh, experiments and your standard experiments. Over here, I have put it as like engineering projects. Engineering projects, it actually involves a lot of experimentation, right? So, we'll be dealing with what are the similarities. In the first column, we'll be dealing with what are the similarities uh, of your engineering experimentation and your standard experiments. Standard experiments basically deals with laboratory experiments, okay? So, what are the similarities in the first column? The second column, what are the differences between these engineering experimentation and your standard experiments? So, first, let's start with the similarities. So when you compare your engineering experiments or your engineering labs and your uh, medical or your other subject standard lab, the main similarity is it is uncertain in nature. We actually don't know what is the, what could be the consequences or what would be the end result of that particular experiments. For example, if you take a case of a nuclear uh, station where you do a whole lot of experiments, but you don't know what happens or if, if some leakage happens from that particular station, we really don't know what it's going to be the consequences. So in that manner, your engineering experimentation and your uh, standard experiments are uncertain in nature. Okay, so the first similarity is, is that they both are uncertain in nature. The second one is that uh, uh, it has a continuous monitoring, which means that your engineering experiments as well as your standard experiments always have a continuous monitoring. Monitoring as such, you will be like, you know, following it up or you will be tracking it on a continuous basis because once you start tracking you will be knowing what is the improvement of that particular experiments so you'll be having continuous uh, you know um, tracking of that particular thing then the next one is uh, we will be having the learning from the past in both experiments in your medical field or in your conventional laboratories or in your engineering experiments 
you will be learning from your past. What are the mistakes that you have done uh, during the past experiments? What are the, uh, you know, uh, things that you have gained from the uh, previous experiments? So you will be learning that, then you will be proceeding with the future experiments. The next one is a partial ignorance. You will be partially ignoring some readings or some, you know, some values as such. In both experiments, in your engineering as well as in your standard experiments, you will be, you know, uh, rounding off your values and you will be, uh, you know, neglecting or you will be partially ignoring some decimal values and all those things. So, you cannot say that the values are accurate and very consistent. So, these are the similarities when you compare with your engineering projects and your uh, standard experiments. Now, let's consider what are the contrast or what are the differences between these both. So, when you compare your engineering uh, projects or your engineering experiments and stand experiments, the one thing that actually makes differences is a controlled uh, system or the controlled situation in which the experiments is being done. Your conventional experiments are uh, doing under the controlled system or controlled conditions, whereas your engineering uh, experiments are not in a controlled conditions. Then the second one is that it has a humane touch, which means that your medical experiments, your laboratory experiments has a humane touch because they will be more dealing with the human bodies. So they are like your extra cautious in those kind of lines because they are dealing with the human bodies, they are living with their lives, All right? They are dealing basically with the human beings. So they will be like a little more concerned about their, you know, the consequence and those things. So your laboratory experiments are in human in uh, nature or that basically deals with the human lives as such. The next one, the difference is they have an informed consent. Your conventional laboratory experiments includes informed consent. For example, if you go for an, um, if you go to a an hospital and uh, your relatives or your friends, anybody has to go through a uh, surgery or something, undergo a surgery or something, you will be or the hospital uh, officials will be providing an undertaking wherein which you will need to sign. You means the authorized person, the blood relation person has to sign an undertaking stating that uh, 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 that particular person knows the, what are the consequences of this particular surgery and we do declare that we know all the consequences and all the terms and conditions re regarding the surgery, which means that there is informed consent in the laboratory experiments, whereas there is no informed consent in your engineering experimentation. And the last one is that uh, they will be having close observation. We already mentioned that in the similarities, we have a uh, closed monitoring or continuous monitoring. But continuous monitoring is different from close observation. When we talk about the laboratory experiments, they are like very closely, they will be observing what are the minute changes that are happening in the experimentation. All right. So these are the basic uh, similarities and differences between the uh, engineering experimentation and your standard experiments or we call it as laboratory experimentations. Now, what is the role of engineers or how we call it as engineers as a responsible experimenters or how best we can define engineers as responsible experimenters in the society. So when we talk about this particular subject, it is a process of developing a product an engineer generally learns through experimentation. When you go, uh, when you go and do your final year project or your mini project, you will be having a title, you will be having a problem to solve. And while doing or while solving those uh, problems, you will be going through different levels of experimentation. And finally, you will be designing a product, which means that an engineering learns the real engineering uh, subjects or the real engineering essence through the experimentation. Now, what are the responsibilities of engineering experimentation or what are the responsibilities of engineers in experimentation? What are things that they need to take care? The first one is a uh, consciousness or we call it as uh, uh, the sense of awareness. Because the particular um, engineer who is doing the experiment should be aware about the surroundings, should be aware about what are the consequences, what are the costs, what are the consequences, what are the after effects of that particular experiment. The second one is informed consent. Informed consent means one should be informed about the facts, which means that while doing an uh, engineering experiment or while doing a particular experimentation, one should be well aware and one should be well informed about the 
facts and figures about or one should be well aware about the information related to that particular experiments. The third one is moral autonomy. We have already discussed about this particular topic in your module 2. Moral autonomy is nothing but it is an uh, it is the ability to think critically and independently because the person who is doing experiments, the engineer who is doing experiments should be in a position to think uh, uh, and uh, you know take decision independently and critically. The last one is accountability. Accountability basically deals with the moral responsibility. That means accountability basically uh, means you, for example, if I am doing the project, I am the responsible person for what are things that happens with that particular project which means that I am responsible for that particular experiment as such, which means that you need to have an accountability of doing that particular experiment. So these are the four responsibilities or four things that engineers must take care when or uh, while he or she do an experiment in your engineering field. Now, what I mean by code of ethics? It is another important topic from module three that is called as code of ethics. Your code of ethics exhibits rights, duties and obligations of the members of a profession and a professional society. So your code of ethics is nothing but it actually deals with what are the rights, what are the duties, what are the obligations that the particular member in that group or that particular member has to exhibit or has to you know oblige to it. Now the code of ethics exhibits some essential role which means that the court exhibits the following essential roles in the society. So basically your code of ethics deals with inspiration and guidance. So when you talk about these essential roles, it is nothing but why we need code of ethics. As I rightly mentioned, code of ethics actually, you know, uh, intimate or actually um, explains what are the duties and what are the rights of a member in a society or in a professional platform. And what is the importance of that? The first one is that it actually inspires, it actually guides the members in the society. The second one is that it actually supports the engineers. When you have a code of ethics, when you have a code of conduct or code of ethics, it actually, you know, guide, it actually supports the engineers to take things forward. Next one is serving and protecting the public. When you have a code of ethics in your profession, it actually helps to serve better to society because what are the experiments that you do? It is basically for the welfare of the society. So it actually helps to serve and protect the public. Education and mutual understanding. When you have a code of ethics, when you have a proper code of ethics, it actually educate you. It actually have a mutual understanding between the members in a professional body. Shared standards. Shared standards means you will be sharing. You will be sharing what are the know-hows or what are the knowledge that you have with the society, with the group. So you'll be having common sharing in the inside the group as such. Create public good image. For example, if you have a um, good institution, uh, for uh, for example, if you have take a consideration, take into consideration the TCS or Wipro or Infosys or Google. So these companies have a reputed image in the society. Why these companies have a reputed images in the society? Because of the fact that they have a code of conduct. They have a code of ethics that has to be followed by each and every employees in the company. So having a good code of ethics actually enhance a good image in the society. Then the, uh, the next one is a deterrence. So deterrence is nothing but it's a discourage to act immorally. So we should be act morally. That's what the whole professional ethics paper is dealing with. Whether it be in a personal or your professional platform. So deterrence actually deals uh, to act you, you know, to discourage to act immorally and it also act enhance, the code of ethics also enhance you with a good amount of discipline in your profession. The last one, it actually promotes the business interest. When you have a good kind of, uh, you know, um, code of ethics or a good code of conduct in your um, profession or in your company, it actually improves your business standards too. So these are the um, significance or these are the roles, essential roles of code of ethics. Now, what are the advantages of code of ethics? Why we need code of ethics? It is help us to set out the ideals and responsibilities of profession. It helps to uh, aware about or it helps us to understand what are the responsibilities in that particular job. It improves the profile of the profession. It also improves the, what are the profile, what are the duties that you need to do, 
what are the things that you, you never do in the profession. All these things will be explaining with code of ethics. Motivate and inspire practitioners. It actually, as I rightly mentioned, it actually motivates and guide the people in the profession. It provides guidance. Again, it actually guides the people in the right way. Raise awareness and consciousness of issues. It actually make you aware about what are the consequences of the issues, what are the drawbacks, what are the after effects of that particular action. And it improves the quality and consistency. As I rightly mentioned, when you have a good code of conduct or good code of ethics, it actually improves the quality as well as the consistency in that particular organization. Now, what are the limits of your code of ethics? It actually, it, when we talk about code of ethics, it depends or it varies from institution to institution. The code of ethics that TCS is following is way different from the code of ethics that the Wipro is following. So basically, when you talk about the demerits or the limitations of code of ethics, it is general and vague wordings. We don't have a very general and or we don't have a very, you know, well polished code of ethics in, in institution, which may lead to misunderstandings and miscommunications. It, it is not applicable to all situations. This code of ethics is not applicable to all situations because the code of ethics differ from situations to situation, space to space and time to time. And it often uh, invites your internal conflicts. When you have code of ethics, it actually, you know, uh, when you talk about the code of ethics, it actually depends on person to person too. So it may invite conflicts between uh, persons or between the people in a group or in a profession as such. So these are the limitations of code of ethics. Now, next important topic is your plagiarism. So module three, the very next important topic is what we call this plagiarism. What do you mean by plagiarism? So plagiarism in short or in simple words, it is being explained as when you take an idea of another person without acclaiming his or her contributions. Okay, so your Princeton, that means uh, the famous Princeton perceives or he, act, uh, the whole uh, professional body of Princeton explains plagiarism as a deliberate use of someone else's language, ideas or any other original material without acknowledging its source. Because normally, uh, take an example, uh, we used to uh, have a different types of inspirational quotes in our daily life. But whenever you write or whenever you quote some inspirational quoting, you need to, your, you uh, normally tend to say that according to Abraham Lincoln or, or according to the words of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. We used to say like that. That's, that's not plagiarism. That's the way in which we actually give an uh, uh, acknowledging or we actually acknowledging the people or we acknowledging the others for his or her contribution. But plagiarism is nothing but you, we actually take or we actually deliberately or you know, uh, it need not to be deliberate but still in most of the cases your plagiarism actually deals with the deliberate actions. When you deliberately take someone's idea or language without giving proper acknowledging to them is what we call it as plagiarism. And Oxford uh, characterizes or Oxford explains plagiarism as a use of a writer's idea or phraseology without giving due credit. And plagiarism can occur in many forms. It can occur in many forms as in like dance, writing, music, music composition, all those lines. I mean, in any sector, in any fields of life, this plagiarism can happen. And uh, what we call originality is actually the innovative, uh, you know, combining, amending, or extending of material from the pool. So, uh, normally we used to say that plagiarism is not a good practice. When it comes to academic excellence or when it comes to your professional excellence, when you take somebody's idea, you need to acknowledge them. If you don't do that, that's what we call as plagiarism. And what are, what are work that we are doing, we need to do it from, you know, our ideas, from our innovative ideas as such. Okay, so that's what the whole concept of plagiarism is about. 